Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, we are going to discuss some more principles of embolism. In a previous session, we had discussed the definition, general principles and features of the most common type. Today, we look at some of the other types of embolism after recapping a few general principles. By definition, we know that embolism is an intravascular, undissolved, solid, liquid or gaseous mass carried by the bloodstream from the site of its origin or entry into the circulation to a distant site from its point of origin. The mass itself is referred to as an embolus if it is single or emboli if there are multiple. The basic thing is that it moves from the point of its origin and reaches a distant site before it blocks the vessel. The process by which this embolus moves in the circulation to a distant site is called embolism or embolization. Invariably because the supply of blood is stopped, there are consequences in the tissue supplied by that particular vessel. The embolus can be classified into multiple different types based on specific features. Depending on the final destination where it will reach, emboli are classified as systemic, pulmonary and paradoxical emboli. Systemic emboli invariably arise from thrombi within the heart or the greater vessels and move into the smaller arteries supplying the tissues. Pulmonary emboli arise from venous side of the circulation, especially in deep venous thrombi and reach the right side of the heart and pulmonary circulation. A paradoxical embolus arises in the venous side of the circulation but passes through a defect in the interatrial septum to reach the systemic circulation. In this figure, you can see that there is a myocardial infarction involving the part of the ventricle at the base of the picture. Overlying this area is a thrombus. These thrombi are friable and can break away in pieces. Those pieces are carried as emboli into the systemic side of the circulation. In the deep veins, thrombi can form, but distal to this thrombus, the circulation becomes stagnant and that column of blood clots. This is the unstable portion which can easily break away and is carried to the right side of the heart as a pulmonary embolus. Remember that 95% of the emboli are derived from thrombi and therefore are called thromboembolus. In this picture, we can see the right atrium filled with one such embolus which has arisen in a deep vein of the leg. It not only filled the atrium, it extended down into the ventricle and up again into the pulmonary trunk, blocking it and finally killing the patient. Emboli can be classified according to the state of the matter that is circulating in the vasculature. It can be solid, it can be liquid or gas. Solids may be thromboemboli, athromatous material from athromatous plaques, fragments of tumor, foreign bodies, parasites, bacterial clumps. Liquid is usually in the form of fat globules which can be derived from the bone marrow and amniotic fluid. Gas can be either air or nitrogen. 
irrespective of whether it is solid, liquid or gas, remember it moves from its point of origin to a distant site before it occludes the vasculature. As most of these emboli are thromboemboli, a majority of the emboli are solid rather than liquid or gas. Yet another way of classifying emboli depends on the presence or absence of infective agents within the sample. For example, if it is the usual thromboembolus, it is usually sterile and therefore it is also called a bl bland embolus. However, in a condition called infective endocarditis, there is the presence of bacteria within the emboli which makes it septic and therefore it can also cause septic consequences in the tissue in which it is lodged. This is an example of a large vegetation attached to the valve of a heart in a case with infective endocarditis. Not only does it have fibrin and platelets, but it also has bacteria, fragments then carried away to other tissues, for example, the spleen or the kidney, not only cause infarction of the tissue, but also cause suppuration. These are called septic emboli. The last and final way in which we can classify emboli is de depends on the process of their development. Most of the emboli we described earlier were pathological emboli. However, in the clinical scenario, sometimes the clinician induces an embolus to control the growth of a tumor or sometimes intractable, intractable bleeding in the GI tract. This is called therapeutic embolization as compared to the pathological emboli we looked at earlier. The consequence of any type of embolus is that it lodges in vessels which are smaller in size than the size of the embolus. It can cause partial or complete occlusion. If the occlusion is partial, it results in ischemia of the tissue that is supplied by that vessel. If the occlusion is complete, it results in infarction or necrosis of the tissue supplied by that particular vessel as a consequence of hypoxia. Let us now look at this example here. We can see that there is a lot of atherosclerotic plaques with superimposed thrombi in the wall of the vessel shown on the left. Let us imagine that these plaques get dislodged and are carried by the vessel to the supplying organ. For example, here the splenic artery supplying the spleen. So if the embolus moves along this blood vessel and enters the vessels of the spleen, it goes into smaller and smaller vessels until it can flow no more. There it blocks the arterial supply to that area of the tissue and causes what is called as ischemic necrosis or infarction of the splenic parenchyma. The pale areas you are seeing in the spleen are areas of infarction consequent to such emboli. Similarly, infarction can occur in many other organs like the kidney, the liver, the brain, the placenta and so on. We will now look at some of the other types of emboli, the first being air embolism. Air embolism by definition means vascular blood flow obstruction caused by a frothy circulating mass made up of air and gas bubbles mixed with the blood. This air usually enters the circulation from the atmosphere or it can be produced within the body when the body is subjected to wide differences in atmospheric pressure. Small quantities of such air emboli are usually asymptomatic. They can reach the alveoli of the lungs and be exhaled. However, if large volumes of air or gas are present in the tissue, they do become clinically symptomatic. The outcome of such emboli depends on the size of the vessel involved, the volume of the air or gas that is entering the circulation and the final destination of the embolus. 
As with the thromboemboli, aerogas emboli can be pulmonary or systemic. When it is pulmonary emboli, small quantities are usually asymptomatic. However, if a volume of more than 100 ml of air is introduced into the venous side of the circulation, it can be symptomatic and even fatal. This air is ca carried to the right side of the heart where during the contraction of the heart, it becomes a frothy mass which does not move much with the circulation and causes blockage of the outflow of the right side of the heart. Characteristically, on clinical auscultation, we hear a mill wheel or machinery murmur when such an air embolus is present in the heart chambers or the pulmonary vessels. It basically stops the outflow of the right heart, stops circulation and therefore prevents venous return to the heart resulting in heart failure. This in turn causes an increase in the pulmonary arterial pressure and respiratory consequences such as bron bronchoconstriction and hypoxemia. As compared to this, systemic circulation is protected from the air embolus that goes into the pulmonary circulation because most of that air is filtered out and exhaled. However, when large quantities of air are present, some of it may cross over into the systemic circulation. If there is an atrial septal defect or a patent foramen ovale, the air from the right side of the heart can pass directly into the systemic circulation. As this air enters the systemic vessels, it goes into smaller and smaller vessels and therefore small volumes are enough to block arterial supply to certain tissues and result in ischemic necrosis or infarction of that tissue. The organs affected in systemic air emboli include the brain, the kidneys, the heart and the skin. Adding to the blockage by this mass is also the detrimental effect caused by accumulating neutrophils and the release of free oxygen radicals in the hypoxic tissues. Air embolism can occur under a multitude of different causes. This list is by no means exhaustive. However, some of the common causes are listed below. They include trauma to the neck, trauma to the thorax, head and neck surgery where vessels are traumatized and air can enter into the vessels, cardiothoracic surgery, very vigorous cardiopulmonary resuscitation, mismanaged deliveries or abortions can also be a cause for air embolism, mismanaged blood transfusions, laparoscopy when pneumoperitoneum is introduced can be a cause for air embolism if it is not carefully monitored. Thoracocentesis and puncture of veins can cause air embolism. Hemodialysis, insufflation of the uterine tubes to detect their patency can also be a cause for air embolism. Acute decompression sickness on the contrary is a specific type of gas embolism which is seen in some patients. Here, the individuals have been exposed to very high atmospheric pressure and then are subjected to sudden rapid decompression. So when they go from that higher pressure to decompression, they develop what is called as acute decompression sickness. This disease is seen in, patient, uh, in scuba divers, deep sea divers, and underwater construction workers. When they descend rapidly from that high atmospheric pressure to the surface, the nitrogen which was in their inhalation mixture comes out of solution and forms bubbles in the blood and in their tissues. This nitrogen also predisposes to activation of platelets and accumulation of platelets thereby causing disseminated intravascular coagulation. A similar change can also be seen in persons 
who go from normal atmospheric pressure to lower atmospheric pressure in rapid ascent in unpressurized aircrafts. When the nitrogen comes out of solution in the joints and soft tissue, it becomes very painful and movement is restricted. This is referred to as the bends. The patients in this bend in a peculiar position which is similar to a fashion seen in the Grecian times. Chokes is when the bubbles are occluding the respiratory vessels and therefore respiratory de distress develops because of local ischemia. Bubbles in the skin cause pruritus and therefore is referred to as the itches. Similarly, bubbles come out in the central nervous system vasculature, initially manifest as irritability, restlessness, confusion, progressing to seizures. If bubbles are there in the spinal vessels, it can cause paralysis, eventually coma and death results. If such manifestations are seen in these patients, usually they are taken back down to the higher atmospheric pressure to allow these bubbles to dissolve and then gradually they are allowed to come back to the surface. Otherwise, they can be also placed in decompression chambers and gradually the pressure can be reduced. Chronic decompression sickness is also referred to as Kazin's disease for the Kazin's chamber that is used in the deep sea work. Here, many gas bubbles form within the bone marrow and in the bone vasculature. This over time results in multifocal ischemic necrosis involving the bones and joint surface. The bones involved usually are the femur, tibia and humerus. When bubbles affect the joint surface, it results in arthritis. Again, this can be averted by slow decompression or giving them an inhalation mixture which contains oxygen and helium instead of nitrogen. The next type of embolism is the amniotic fluid embolism. This is a grave complication seen in during labor or in the immediate postpartum period. It is seen in about 1 in 40,000 deliveries. It has about 80 percent mortality and an infusion of the amniotic fluid goes through ruptured placental membranes or torn uterine veins or cervical veins to lodge in the maternal alveolar capillaries. The risk factors for amniotic fluid embolism include uterine and cervical tears, abdominal trauma, during pregnancy, cesarean sections, instrumental delivery per vagina resulting in tears locally, during amniocentesis, drugs induced to induce labor for example mesoprostol where the forced contractions may drive the amniotic fluid into maternal vasculature. It is also seen in the elderly pre uh, women who are uh, pregnant, example a maternal age over 35 years, polyhydramnios, placenta previa and abruption of the placenta are other risk factors. Fetal tissues like lanigo hair, vernix caseosa, squamous cells, meconium and mucus enters the maternal vasculature and is carried to the maternal pulmonary circulation. This material is rich in thromboplastin which promotes coagulation in the maternal vasculature precipitating disseminated intravascular coagulation in all the microcirculation. This is also knows, uh, known as consumption coagulopathy as all the coagulation factors and the platelets in the maternal circulation are utilized for these thrombi resulting in a deficiency elsewhere. The plasmin system gets activated, it induces breakage of these thrombi that are formed in circulation and in turn precipitates bleeding in all the tissues. So, initially the patient manifests with 
dyspnea and cyanosis. It progresses to headache, convulsions, coma and finally shock and death. Because of the disseminated intravascular coagulation, they are prone to develop hemorrhages in the variety of tissues and excessive bleeding including postpartum hemorrhage. Pulmonary edema and acute respiratory distress follows. As a result of hypoxia, fetal distress and fetal death also results. The next type of embolus is the fat embolus. Here, flat globules are introduced into the circulation. Usually, they are seen after fracture of long bones, multiple fractures, extensive soft tissue trauma and with intramedullary nailing to repair fractures. These account for about 90 percent of the patients with fat emboli. The other causes include extensive burns, vigorous cardiopulmonary resuscitation which can cause rib fractures and sternal fractures and precipitate fat emboli, liposuction and acute pancreatitis. The fat globules aggregate and cause mechanical obstruction of blood vessels. Also lipases in circulation release free fatty acids which are toxic to the endothelial cells and in turn promote disseminated intravascular coagulation. So in addition to the mechanical obstruction, biochemical injury also results and this in turn promotes hemolytic anemia pan platelet activation resulting in thrombocytopenia, also granulocyte activation and oxygen free radical injury. Pulmonary fat embolism in turn is seen most often in patients with fractures. Small emboli are asymptomatic, large and extensive emboli go to the right side of the heart and then into the pulmonary circulation. This in turn causes tachypnea, dyspnea, tachycardia, right heart failure and death. As with all other emboli, if the pressure in the right heart increases, patent foramen ovales when present facilitate the movement of fat emboli from the pulmonary side of the circulation into the systemic circulation. Systemic fat emboli can reach the brain kidneys, retina, skin and blood. When the vasculature in the brain is involved, it results in irritability, restlessness, delirium, coma which can last for hours and finally death which is usually within about two days of the episode. In kidney, renal dysfunction can result and fat emboli are sometimes detected in the urine of the patient. Retinal fat emboli result in striae hemorrhages and fluffy exudates. Skin vessels involved cause diffuse petechial rash and this is one of the identifying features usually seen on the second day after the fat embolization. As far as blood is involved, anemia is a feature seen along with red cell aggregates and a hemolytic picture with thrombocytopenia. A number of other types of emboli are described. Tumor emboli are seen quite commonly in renal cell carcinoma and carcinoma of the lung. Foreign body emboli are seen such as bullets, silk, talc, sometimes polythene tubing used in catheters, cotton fibers used to cleanse before venipuncture, cellulose. Parasites like schistosome ova and plasmodium are also known to cause emboli in the circulation. We have now recapped the definition of embolus. We have seen that there are four different ways in which emboli can be classified. We studied specific features of air embolism, amniotic fluid embolism, fat embolism and a miscellaneous group of emboli. Thank you.